Well, it's a very good afternoon to you. Welcome to Rights and Recourse. This is where we tackle legal issues, bringing you information and, of course, analysis. My name is Sipiwo Zawumbi. Now, in the course of our discussion, we'll open our lines and give you an opportunity to give us your views. The number to dial is 011-714-5497 and, of course, 5498. If not, you can be a part of our discussion on Twitter. Join us on Twitter. The Twitter handle is at Rights Recourse. Or simply email us at Rights and Recourse at sabc.co. ZA. Good afternoon. Now, a substantial number of fraudulent claims are submitted to the Road Accident Fund, leading to time and money spent on undeserving claims. Just recently, Road Accident Fund reviewed its internal management claim system, enabling the agency to identify pro potentially fraudulent claims. But despite this, vulnerable victims of road accidents continue to be swindled by unscrupulous lawyers. Today on Rights and Recourse, we explore the ethical nature of how the Road Accident Fund lawyers abused the claiming system for damages. But first, let's have a look at this insert. I know that if your fees dependent on the result you get from me, you're more likely to really apply yourself than if the contrary were the case. Obviously, ethically, an attorney is always supposed to do the best for his or her client, and we do. But it's a fact, you know, if, if, if you know that your fee is going to be that much better, if you get your client that much better result, you may be more highly motivated. And that became the system throughout more than 70% of all attorneys in practice. It was adopted, as I say, by the Law Society of the Northern Provinces, which governs more than 60% of all practicing attorneys. Um, it was adopted by the Law Society of the Free State. It was endorsed by the Black Lawyers Association. It was used unofficially throughout KwaZulu-Natal, and even though the Cape Law Society had not permitted its members to do so, it was used by the attorneys as well. And that was a standard system, officially from 2002, as I say, and in, in over 70% of the jurisdiction of attorneys in practice. Uh, a challenge was brought against that system of fees on the basis that there is an act in South Africa called the Contingency Fees Act, uh, which was introduced and came into force in 1999. And that made a, a very complicated act, and in fact it's been referred to by many experts, including highly respected Supreme Court of Appeal Judge Malcolm Wallace, uh, when he delivered a paper in August 2010, uh, where he said that um, the standard form of a contingency litigation, no win, no fee litigation in South Africa, is the attorney takes a straight percentage, usually 25% uh, of the damages recovered, and it works well, and the public are happy with it. And he went on to remark that, yes, South Africa does have a Contingency Fees Act, but it's poorly drafted, um, really hard to understand, and it's simply ignored by attorneys. And that was the case, and that was the truthful reflection. Um, because the Act is, uh, there are as many opinions as to how the Act applies as there are lawyers that interpret it. And in fact, uh, in recent times from 2011 to date, various judges have had opportunity to give decisions as to what the Act actually means, and everyone's come to a different conclusion. Uh, in one case, the judge says, well, in addition to the attorney's fee, he or she can keep the cost recovered from the other side. Another judge says, no, those costs must go to the client. Yet another judge said, well, the cap, which I'll come to in terms of that Act, must include the fees of the advocate in addition to the attorney's fees. It's fraught with complications, and in fact, when the, the challenge to the straight, simple method of a straight percentage fee came to the Constitutional Court, where there was an appeal lodged against the Pretoria High Court decision uh, in what was a challenge by the South African Association of Personal Injuries, uh, not really a challenge, but it presented what's called a stated case. It said to the court, look, give us a ruling, we want to know, can you charge a straight percentage fee or not? Uh, does the Contingency Fees Act preclude prevent persons contracting with their attorneys if they want to and the attorney is happy to do so. In other words, is freedom of contract between consenting adults excluded by the Contingency Fees Act? And uh, the Pretoria High Court said yes, the Act is everything and you can't act on contingency save in terms of the Act. And in an appeal, uh, which uh, application for an appeal to the Constitutional Court, whilst the Court didn't grant the appeal, it gave an interesting judgment where it said that there has been widespread confusion in the profession as to the correct meaning of the Contingency Fees Act. And the court went on to say, the question which arose is, can an attorney contract with a client to act outside the provisions of the Contingency Fees Act or not? And then the court went on to say, certain law societies made rulings permitting its members to do so. And that was the Law Society of the Northern Provinces and the Free State Law Society. 
All right, and now to discuss uh, today's topic, we're joined in studio by Mr. Mbusani Mabu Mabunda, uh, co-chairperson of the Law Society of South Africa, and we also like to welcome uh, Mr. Chris uh, Valemse, a senior manager in the regulation department from the Road Accident Fund. And later on, we'll also have a victim, or rather a victim's mother, Ms. Amina Modara from Johannesburg, who will be joining us on the line just to give us uh, a few details of her case, or rather her daughter's case. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on Rights and Recourse. Let's perhaps start our discussion with you, Chris. Uh, what could have prompted the Road Accident Fund to actively encourage uh, the beneficiaries to now claim directly on the fund as opposed to having a middleman, which is a lawyer? Thank you. Over the past years, uh, more, uh, some 10 years ago, the fund was very legalistic uh, as an organization. Uh, we did not put the client's interests first and we practiced and operated very much like a legal firm. Mm -hmm. This resulted in many claims prescribing and a lot of claimants being unable to access benefits which they actually in law are entitled to directly from us, causing them to use intermediaries which had the result that claims took a long time to settle, there was a lot of litigation pertaining to those claims, mm -hmm. and also unnecessary costs. Nothing in the Road Accident Fund Act precludes a claimant from mm -hmm. claiming directly from the fund. Mm -hmm. And what the fund has does, it has focused in on its client services, it's making it much easier for claimants to approach the fund it by assisting them with their claims. When you talk about difficulties on the previous or rather the current prevailing system, uh, what, what, what challenges uh, does it have, especially in the interest of the beneficiary? The current system is very complicated in terms of quantifying a claim under the law because it's a delictual system that requires the claimant to prove fault. It then requires the claimant to prove the damages sustained as a result of the accident, which in, in the normal course requires expert reports. What had happened in, uh, with regards to the road accident fund regulations recently is that there, there, there have been amendments that enable the fund mm -hmm. to assist those claimants to obtain medical reports and even um, serious injury assessments that are required to access a certain component of the damages as in general damages for serious injury. Mm -hmm. So there have been legislative amendments to facilitate claiming and we're busy with a draft amendment bill currently to, to, to make it uh, even easier to claim and eventually we're moving over to a no-fault system under the, the RAB system mm -hmm. where a, a fault is no longer a requirement, where benefits are predefined and where the role of an attorney in the scheme basically uh, falls away because there are not many instances where you would have disputes mm -hmm. as to who caused the accident, also not uh, what you entitled from the scheme as opposed to the current dispensation mm -hmm. which is uh, fraught with litigation and disputes. All right, let's come to you Mr. Mabunda. I do understand that as a law society you've got res reservations of your own when it comes to uh, the now being introduced uh, program. You also had challenges with the, pr uh, the previous one, especially in cases where you find that uh, you are represented as a middleman, you were coming in as the middleman in these claims, uh, but now it seems like Road Accident Fund is taking or rather putting you aside. Uh, what other challenges or other questions or reservations do you have with the system? Let me point out that um, what is happening is that um, there is a process which is underway and uh, this process involves uh, parliament mm -hmm. and uh, the stakeholders including uh, the law society and other stakeholders are busy or have already sent their express views on what they see as uh, the limitations on the mm -hmm. proposed bill and uh, but the main thing is that uh, is the ousting of the jurisdiction mm -hmm. of practitioners um, there is an inherent right of uh, citizens to be legally represented mm -hmm. and the benefit of being legally represented is that there is amongst other things a fair assessment which is done which makes sure that uh, the clients who suffer damages are not actually uh, under, under, under settled so that is very critical mm -hmm. but let me point out that uh, there is absolutely nothing which stops an individual from approaching an institution directly 
But what should be coming out clear is the fact that there shouldn't be submissions or peddling of information to the effect that do not go to lawyers. All right. But let's talk about uh, the now so popular, all over the place, uh, unscrupulous claims. Uh, you've got lawyers who represent these beneficiaries. And in most cases, uh, the funds never make it to the beneficiaries or rather the victims from the accidents. Isn't this perhaps a remedial action by the road accident fund to uh, you know, now give an opportunity and actively encourage those who are supposed to claim from the fund to come directly without a, a, a third member? Poignant to point out, although it might be outside the ambit, but very relevant. It seems to me as if uh, the publicity regarding the existence of the Attorney's Fidelity Fund has not reached uh, the public to the extent which it should have. In um, what way? In the sense that, and then members of the public do not seem to be aware in the majority that in the event. Uh, they have been, uh, money has been stolen mm -hmm. away from them. There is a recourse which they do have and processes which they can follow for them to be reimbursed whatever which might have been stolen against uh, the practitioners in the form of the Attorney's Fidelity Fund. I'm, mm -hmm. just, I, I'm, I'm just thinking that it's important to use this platform to bring it to the attention of members that that is there. All right, but moving right along, let's, yes. let's get back to can the can issue. Can I maybe comment yes, on, that, on that mm -hmm. statement? Um, I don't think it's that the, the, the public is not aware of the existence of the fund. Mm -hmm. I had a look at the 2014 annual report for the fund, and in that report, uh, the chairperson or the chairperson states in the preamble that uh, claims against the fund have doubled in the past five years. Uh, that fund is under such constraints at the moment that they are proposing amending legislation to cap their liability. So clearly, mm -hmm. just through the number of claims that they're receiving, there must be an awareness of. Um, the liability the issue. The liability so in terms of attorneys uh, stealing it, trust Isn't this funds. development then, law society, if then this is what the Road Accident Fund is proposing, in the interest of the beneficiary? Just, just a sec. Mm -hmm. I am restricting myself to the third party related issues. Okay. And then uh, I so happen to know extensively about uh, that particular fund. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the claims which are being lodged against uh, the Road Accident Fund, as mm -hmm. things stand, it does not relate to third party matters. Okay. Yes. But now let's talk about the recourse of the victims. Majority, 85% of them, are coming forward, especially the claims that have been lodged on the Road Accident Fund. These are people who were awarded a certain percentage of money but never made it to them because the lawyers captured it. Why, as the Law Society, aren't you taking initiative? Well, the true state of affairs, or else it is incorrect to say that, and then there are no initiatives which are being taken by, well, uh, by, various, by, by various law societies. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you were to request for information and you were to say to me that I have requested information from the various law societies mm -hmm. and then they have not furnished me with the information on uh, what actions they are taking with respect to reported cases, right. then uh, you would be in a better state to say that the law societies are, are not doing anything. No, no, definitely, but let's talk about the few cases doing, that have been reported. Something, yes. The few cases that involve you as the law society. Let's talk about the cases that uh, talk about the victims or other millionaires who are millionaires just in context of being awarded, but never have these funds. Okay. Let what about those? Yes. Let, let's be specific with respect to uh, the case of uh, the Eastern Cape, the one mm. which was uh, in, in the Sunday Times. Yes. Yes. There are important features. Maybe but before we get into that, uh, that case, Mr. Mabunde, let's yes. just take a breather so that we'll come back with more details for the viewer. Well, this is Rights and Records. You're watching us right here on SABC News Channel 404. Today we're discussing issues surrounding the road accident fund and, of course, the new model that's being introduced. We've got the Law Society joining us right in studio to give us their stance in this issue and, of course, their reservations and why they perhaps think this new system will not work well. Well, we'll also so, welcoming your views. The number is 011-714-5497-5498. Rights and Recourse will continue after this. Stay with us. Today takes an in-depth look 
on news locally, continentally and globally. We bring the world to your home. We cover all economy news extensively to keep you informed. We are live to break news as and when they happen across the world. We analyze news using experts in all aspects. Make a date with News Today every Monday to Friday from 3 to 5.30 p.m. Well, welcome back. We are now joined um, online by the victim's mother, Miss Amina Mudara, who's basically going to give us a stance, or rather, uh, what she went through as the mother to the victim. A person was awarded quite a huge amount by the Road Extend Fund, but has been struggling to access those funds since. Well, Amina, welcome to Rights and Recourse. I, I didn't hear that. Amina, welcome to Rights and Recourse. Welcome you on the show. Thank you. Now, just just tell us, or rather, you know, just try to bring us bring it down to us. What exactly you went through, uh, the struggle you went through. I know that uh, your daughter was injured in a car accident, and she, you have been struggling to access the funds since. Uh, what have you went through since the accident? Uh, you know, it, it it was the fact that uh, the claim took so long. That was the first thing. She had to see so many doctors, so many specialists, and eventually, when she was awarded. Then a year, year and a half later, we hear that she was not awarded everything that she should have been awarded. Mm -hmm. and, and my feeling is just that after having gone through the trauma of really losing her in an accident, having lawyers who, by the way, approached us, we did not approach them, mm -hmm. then you hear that she did not get all her money. And one then wonders, who do you trust in a situation like this? Mm -hmm. Because because of the brain damage, she cannot really work, you know, she worked for a little while, but she couldn't, she's in hospital, has been in hospital since November last year, and then you have this hanging over you, where, where you now have to fight with the people that were supposed to assist you, mm. and it just leaves a very bitter place, because it's your lawyers, they're fighting on your behalf, and now you have to fight them, how do you do that? I mean, when you got the information that you were not awarded what's actually due to you, what exactly do you mean that, uh, by that? Were you given far less than what you actually deserve with the lawyer in the picture? Yes, according to what is going at, at the moment, I can't really talk about the case because mm -hmm. it's subjudicated in yes. court at the moment, but according to what happened was, the, she was awarded six point something million and when the investigation went in it was found that there was one million more that was supposed to come to her mm -hmm. and and she didn't receive that mm -hmm. what has happened since did you consult your lawyers did you write to the law society have you consulted the road extent fund just to put your case forward no we didn't what happened was uh, i think a lady that worked in this firm actually had documents Mm -hmm. that she then presented to Yasmin and brought lawyers to her that then said that they would fight her case for her. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you still on the line? Yes, I am. All right. So you, you, you didn't write to the Law Society. You didn't consult a road accident fund. You had a representative, however. Uh, uh, what has yes. your lawyer told you since? Well, from the, the first lawyer or the second one? The second one. The second one. Well, they, they appear, I think they took it to court. They're now waiting and uh, to hear whether she will be awarded the money that was not paid to her the first time. So at this point, we do not know how far the case has gone because she's not the only person. Mm. All right. I mean, I thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your story with us right here in Rights and Records. And of course, that was Amina Modara, who was joining us from Johannesburg. Being the mother to the victim, um, you know, she was awarded a certain amount of money. Uh, the money, well, some of the money went to the, to, the, to, to the trust fund. But she wasn't really awarded what was due to her. Do you think that perhaps that's the issue, or rather a, a corruptibility in the side of a road accident fund, or perhaps your side as the law society? I'm not fully appraised with mm. the facts, and uh, it will be very, very uh, speculative. But in this for, very for case, either, she said her very, her very first lawyer didn't award her what was due to No, her. the lawyers do not award. It's well, courts, she did, it's courts, it's, it's no, courts, no, no, it's which, courts which, which award. But the, the funds are transferred through who? 
through the lawyers. Exactly. So yes. that's that's what we're trying to establish. If the lawyers didn't give, or rather, did, especially to those who are not well schooled when it comes to legal matters, uh, this is just one of many victims. People who suffer in silence, or rather, go uh, without really uh, accessing what's due to them. What are you? I know that you said that you've got in initiatives in place and not trying to bash you on the side. I do acknowledge that. But in cases like those, what do you encourage other beneficiaries to do, especially in Amina's case? You see, um, you are understanding the facts as she presenting it differently mm -hmm. to how I understand it. How do you understand them? I understand, uh, I understand uh, to be saying that uh, the award which uh, she got was not, uh, was, was not enough and then it was supposed to be to have been a higher award. I didn't That's hear her. I didn't hear her to be saying that the lawyers have actually uh, taken the money. It, it, I heard her to be saying that the lawyers have, have basically failed to cause her to get enough money. In other words, she got less. Well, clearly she didn't give us the whole details so, of the story. That, yes. um, in this very case, she has also struggled to access some of those funds. So who can we blame? Well, it depends on the circumstances, and that will bring me to the issue regarding uh, Curator Bonis, mm -hmm. which seems to be applicable to the case which you might still be going to. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, she indicated that uh, her child is uh, having some uh, brain, yes. brain damages, mm -hmm. and then there are issues relating to how do we deal with such, uh, mm -hmm. su su such matters. Mm -hmm. If she was the litigant herself, and then there was no what we call curator ad litem. Mm. Curator ad litem is someone who basically does uh, prosecute the case on behalf of the injured person due to the condition of that right. injured person. Okay. Now, when it comes to money, she has alluded to the fact that there were a lot of experts there and all that. It might be, it might, and I emphasize might. might be, all that. Right there may be a need for to appoint what is called a curator bonus. Okay. A curator bonus is a person who is appointed by the court to look into the financial mm -hmm. affairs of that particular person mm -hmm. because medically speaking and then that person cannot manage his or her own funds. All right. And quickly, okay. the moment the curator bonus is appointed by the court of law, mm -hmm. the lawyer who has a mandate ceases to be the lawyer and the curator bonus is the one who takes over right. and do the management of those funds. All right, Chris, let's just quickly come to you. Do you do understand that there's a case that's currently in court uh, between you and the Law Society from the Northern Cape, a road accident fund? You, you know, there are four and two and from battles. Uh, you seem not to have really clear uh, agreements or rather terms with the Law Society. And this new or rather proposed uh, to be initiated uh, new procedure of claiming, uh, how is this going to be different? Is this perhaps going to improve the relationship between you and the Law Society? society and the beneficiaries as well? You're speaking to the new RAB system? Yes. Um, well, at the moment the law society is not in support of the RAB system for a mm -hmm. number of reasons. Um, from a claimant perspective, it's an imminently better system mm -hmm. in that access to benefits would be expedited, okay. access to benefits are certain, Treatment happens as close as possible after the accident, which isn't possible under the current dispensation, mm -hmm. and then leaves accident victims dependent on family and friends to assist them until such time as the claim is settled, mm -hmm. which could take years depending on whether it's a litigated matter. In the interim, that, that patient has to rely on uh, provincial health, um, the goodness of friends and family. So under the new system, you know what you're going to get, you know you're going to get it quickly, you're not going to dispute who was at fault. Mm -hmm. um, for that reason, uh, as I've iterated earlier, the, the role of the attorney becomes um, not as important as not it is currently. Mm -hmm. Not null and void. Mm -hmm. Not as important. All right. Well, let's just go and hear what Stella has to say. Uh, Stella is calling us from Limpopo. Stella, welcome to Rights and Records. Thank you. I, 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 yes, I just wanted. Yes, I just wanted to ask from the guy from the Road Extent Fund. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the procedure I, I going forward? If you've got an accident, what is the procedure? Because I think it's going to help a lot of people who don't know. Because I've realized that here, yeah, some lawyers go to the hospitals immediately you get an accident. You are being called by some people which you don't know, claiming that they are lawyers and stuff like that. So I wanted uh, the men from the road accident fund to explain to the public what is the procedure 
going forward. If I've got an accident now, what do I do? What is the step if I don't want to go to the lawyers? Thank you very much. All right. I, I suppose, Chris, you have to take on that one. Just quickly, sure. uh, what she can do uh, if I she has been in an accident, especially because she doesn't want to be represented. Okay. It's important that the claimant understands the, the implications of going through an attorney. Mm -hmm. When you use an attorney, the attorney is going to provide services at a fee. If you're lucky, the attorney will stick to the uh, Contingency Fees Act and only take a quarter of your compensation mm -hmm. in addition to other disbursements that they incur in pr prosecuting the claim, which can take a very long time if they go to court. Mm -hmm. Your alternative is to claim directly. In that instance, you can phone the Road Accident Fund. There's a call center. Uh, I can give you the number now. Mm -hmm. It's 860 23 The Road Accident Fund will assist you with your claim. In which event, obviously, you would not pay any fees, mm -hmm. and what and the settlement that you get is goes to you. All right, Mr. Mabuna, it's, it seems like your your role in this world claiming system is is really being eradicated. What are you doing? What 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 do you think about this, especially this new system? It seems to be yes. taking you off the picture. Yes, it is very important for the public to actually understand that there is no one in the form of a claimant who is barred from going directly to make a claim. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, people should be warned about the catastrophic effects of uh, going directly so that when they do exercise... Just give us one of two of, of those effects. One of them is underpayments. All right. There are a lot of claimants who went directly to make claims and were underpaid and they subsequent to that went to lawyers after the payment and the lawyers prosecuted claims on their behalf and recouped substantial millions mm. which means that there was no fair compensation right now it's a choice of a client if you want to go and you put yourself in that potential of under settlement which is a fact uh, in, 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 in certain instances is the choice of the client but uh, when you go to a lawyer, of course you do pay, but what is expected from a lawyer I is that you, you are likely the to, be, uh, to, be, to, here, to, be, to be assisted. Just uh, quickly, the highlighted yes. issue here is the fact that these lawyers dupe uh, these beneficiaries. You find that one has been awarded a 9.2 million, but they can only, or rather through uh, the, the transaction that's been made through the lawyer, they only access a, a small portion of that amount. Yes. So what about those unscrupulous uh, uh, then, um, uh, transactions and, and those claims as well? Two things. Mm -hmm. One, on reporting, the law society has got mechanisms in place uh, to deal with such lawyers. And if proven, there is a substantial number of those unscrupulous lawyers who have since been struck off the roll mm -hmm. for doing that. And members of the public, I must reiterate this one, and uh, I believe my friend will now accept that I've got more knowledge with respect to the Attorney's Fidelity Fund. They must know about the existence of that fund mm -hmm. so that they can be duly compensated in the event and they how successfully And how is it benefiting the beneficiary, pro 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 the claimant? Pro pro prove the claim. How, how is that going to benefit the claimant? Well, what we are saying from a governance point of view, mm -hmm. is that any person who has been undone through unscrupulous means by lawyers, there is a special fund which uh, is able to compensate uh, that, that particular matter. And as a profession, we do have due processes with which we, de we deal with. And then depending on the nature and gravity of uh, how the money has been lost, it does right. result in those people being kicked out of the system of the law. Mm -hmm. may, I, may, may I respond? Just, just uh, quickly, we have to take an air break, Chris. Sure. But, uh, just keep that point, jot it down, and then after the break, we'll deal with that issue. Well, there's still rights and recourse right here on SABC Channel 404. We're still dealing with the issues surrounding the road accident fund. We also want to hear your view. The number is 011-714-5497. And of course, 5498. I'm also checking your tweets right there at rights recourse. And of course, your emails at rights and recourse at SABC. Stay with us. We're coming back.
technology isn't all scary. There's also fun stuff like gaming. Lots of women do play games, whether it's on their phones or their tablets. Then there are Africans who are using new tools to make other people's lives much easier. We typed the whole CV on a small QWERTY Nokia phone. For all these and other technology and social media news, join me, Spumelele Zondi, every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. Central African Time on SABC News. Well, welcome back. You're still watching Rights and Recourse, talking about the issues that are surrounding the Rod Exchange Fund. Uh, before the break, we had uh, Mr. Mabunda trying to elaborate to us about the role of the Rod Exchange Fund, or rather the Law Society, in the negotiations between the Rod Exchange Fund and, of course, uh, the claimant. But it seems like there are still issues. Um, I do understand. What well, Chris, also, as the Rod Exchange Fund, you've been bankrupt for 30 years. I mean, you declared yourself as bankrupt for 30 years. Um, but besides that, especially for those who have been claiming directly to the Rod Exchange Fund, the fund itself. Um, what's the uh, reason or rather the benefit of setting aside these trust funds um, not to access the money altogether? Why would you suggest or rather why do you suggest that uh, the beneficiaries have a separate uh, trust fund? We do not pay into a trust fund unless there is a, unless there is a curator appointed for a specific claimant. Mm -hmm. uh, a curator is appointed in those instances where the claimant is unable to manage his, his or her own funds. Mm -hmm. If that's not the case, we pay the claimant directly. So it doesn't go, in, because you're not using an attorney, the payment doesn't go into an attorney's trust account where you don't have control over payment to the claimant. Mm -hmm. You must understand as a road accident fund, we're not a party to the attorney-client relationship and therefore we're not in a position to force an attorney to pay over funds to his client. Mm -hmm. The most we can do and what we do do is we assist those claimants who uh, have not received payment to report the matter to the police mm -hmm. and also to uh, prepare a complaint to the relevant law society. Mm -hmm. That's those claimants in those instances where they do require our assistance. Um, I, in, before the break, I just needed to come back to two yes. aspects. One being, uh, there was a comment made that uh, a, a client to take, takes on the risk to claim directly because the fund may undersettle. Mm -hmm. Just to be clear, that, that same risk arises when you instruct an attorney. Mm -hmm. In the August 2015 risk alert uh, newsletter issued by the Law Society and attorney in, uh, the Attorneys Indemnity Fund, the following statement is made. Mm -hmm. Rough prescription and undersettlement remains a significant problem. That's now by attorneys. 40% of all their claims relate to this, undersettlement of claims and prescription of claims. That's mm -hmm. where an, a, a, a client elected to use an attorney. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if the risk only resides in instances where you approach the fund directly. And what the fund has done is mm -hmm. we're putting in place policies and procedures to manage those instances where we may have dropped the mm -hmm. ball. All right. Is this perhaps the case, especially in Avila Matiba's case? No, no, no. I'm obliged to you respond to that. Yeah, that just, uh, just quickly, uh, as you wanted to object to what yes, Chris wanted to raise. there are matters of uh, prescription mm -hmm. which affect the road accident fund, yeah. where the road accident fund said that uh, members of the public uh, should be claiming directly to them. Mm -hmm. And then they were hit by prescription of claims, and that resulted in the road accident fund uh, doing something which, as the law society, have already told them that it's unprofessional. All right. Where they engage the services of uh, okay. their own attorneys from inside to institute an action against the road accident fund, uh, which is something which is extremely unprofessional, and uh, it's something which the law society is dealing with because because they, they cannot do that. So it's very important that and then we do the, the balancing. All right. Let's just go and hear for what uh, Sam from Pumalanga has to say. Uh, Sam, welcome to Rights and Recourse. Uh, good day, sir. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I'm well, thank you. Um, um, I just want to find out here. I just want to know uh, the difference between uh, the claim of being injured on an accident or uh, and the claim of being traumatized while they're involved in an accident. Mm -hmm. Is it claimable or which one is claimable or which one is not claimable between the two? That's right. my question. Chris, would you like to, to answer that? It depends when the accident occurred. 
So if the accident occurred prior to 1 August 2008, uh, emotional shock is, uh, is, an, is an instance in which you could claim general damages from the road accident fund. Subsequent to the amendment of the Act in 2000, uh, 1 August 2008, it took effect that on that date, you can still claim for emotional shock, but not for secondary emotional shock. So that's an instance where you would have witnessed an accident or heard of an accident, but not self been involved in one. All right. Now, let's get into the case of uh, uh, paraplegic Avela Matimba, who, who is supposedly the only millionaire living off a 1,400 rands monthly uh, state grant. He is a 26-year-old who was awarded a total of 9.6 million rands in two desperate uh, damages claim, uh, claims against the Road Accident Fund and the Eastern Cape Department of Health. Um, I know that you're well aware of this case. What are the details? I know that uh, it's sub care, you don't want to get into it, but what, what exactly led uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Avela staying this long uh, without really being given was due to him, especially, especially the 1.4 um, monthly grant? What is important for us uh, as the law society, and mm -hmm. perhaps I should qualify that the law society does not deal directly with the disciplinary, uh, disciplinary cases, mm -hmm. and that the relevant provincial law societies are the ones who are statutorily charged with the responsibility of dealing with uh, disciplinary cases. Mm -hmm. um, this matter, I understand that and then it's something, it, it's under investigation by uh, two respective law societies, mm -hmm. which will be the Law Society of the Free State as well as the Law Society of the, of, of, of the Northern Provinces. All right. But what is key, what uh, is key for the purpose yes. of the public from where we stand mm -hmm. as the law, law society is the factual position, one, of whether or not the lawyer has appropriated the money to himself. And that is a, that's a factual inquiry. And number two is the circumstances which have led to the delay in terms of payment and but, but the lawyer is also yes. accused of having claimed damages to the Eastern Cape Department of Health without informing the victim. What then do you have to say about that? But you read the same article which I have read. But and those the, are the, the details. The, the, no, the, the article itself, if you read, uh, not a casual reading, it does say mm -hmm. what he actually said. He has said that he has brought it to the attention of client and then he was acting through the mandate of mm -hmm. the client. So it's his word against hers. So we shouldn't say that um, uh, uh, he, he claimed without the knowledge. But clearly you're coming in the defense of these lawyers. I no, mean, we no, no, no. I'm, I'm not coming into his defense. All I'm saying is the article. Me and you are being guided by the article. Let's talk and about other cases that perhaps I'm saying not. the very article the lawyer responds to that say that the client knew, I'm not defending him, I'm reading what he has said. All right, let's talk about the cases that have not been documented, like uh, the Lusikisiki case, yes. where the actuality, or rather the reality, is that these lawyers are given the funds. They go behind the victim to claim uh, from, the, from the trust, or rather from the Department of Health, without informing them. What, what then? I know that you said that you're taking this step, but this is continuing. I mean, people are being duped every day, and seemingly you're standing back as the law society. Now you're being replaced, or rather your position is being put aside. And you, you are not happy with that by the Road Accident Fund Let in me the new system? Yes, I, I have to qualify that and then we must be clear and unequivocal that we are not mm -hmm. saying that people should not claim directly. Mm -hmm. We are saying that there are consequences for doing that. Right. Now, if, if, if ever we're going to have a cycle, a merry-go-round flowing from what will happen some 10 years down the line, and then you will find the people starting to complain and say that it was better to go to lawyers. So well, people if, are already people, if, complaining people go, if people knowingly mm -hmm. go to, to, the, to the road accident fund, we can't stop them from doing that. But what we are saying is that the people do have the right to engage the services of practitioners and it's their choice to exercise that particular right. All right. Well, let's take Zueli. Zueli is calling us from KZN. Zueli, welcome to Rights and Recourse. Yes, good day. Good day, um, good day sir. You know, good day. My, my question is uh, from the RAF car. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, a person was uh, involved in an accident or was injured, and that particular person was a passenger in a vehicle uh, which is found to be unlicensed or unroadworthy, because mm -hmm. I have read uh, an issue before in the paper where a victim was not compensated because RAF found that uh, that vehicle was uh, unlicensed. Mm -hmm. 
just a bad question if uh, can I claim compensation if I was uh, injured in an unlicensed vehicle or unloaded vehicle for that nature? Thank you. All right. Uh, Chris, can Zweli claim? Sure. Again, there was an amendment to the Act in 1 August 2008 in which uh, prior to, if you had uh, been involved in an accident prior to that date, it would have been relevant whether the vehicle was licensed if, for instance, it was mm -hmm. a, a fair paying passenger. Um, subsequent to 1 August 2008, it's no longer relevant for purposes of claiming. In other words, if you are a passenger in an unlicensed taxi, it's irrelevant mm -hmm. for purposes of your claim. You would be able to claim there wouldn't be any caps applicable to your claim. But there are also cases where you find that the victim, or rather, yeah, the victim, is being told that he cannot access the funds because, I mean, in case, uh, like Zueli said, that uh, the, the vehicle was found to not be in a good condition, or rather, the driver, let's say in a case where it was a taxi, the driver was drunk, uh, the vehicle was not roadworthy, and those people, such people, are not awarded what's due to them. Chris? Every matter is dealt with on its own facts. Now, if the driver was drunk, or the vehicle was unroadworthy. You could have an instance where a claim is repudi repudiated on the basis of voluntarily assumption of the risk. It's in very rare instances that that, however, happens. Mm -hmm. If a driver is walking outside of the vehicle blind, drunk, unable to stand up, and you get into that vehicle, you assume a risk. If you understand the risk and you get into that vehicle, there may be a chance that your claim is repudiated. But, but are these loopholes for you not to uh, pay back what's due to the beneficiaries then? Okay, if then you're going to look at such issues. Let's then discuss RAPS. Mm. Under RAPS, there won't be any repudiations in terms of the scenarios I just uh, outlined. So, fault is no longer an issue. Mm -hmm. um, we're moving to a system where more claimants mm -hmm. would access benefits faster um, it will be certain what they are requiring and they will get treatment uh, much sooner with a better treatment outcome. All right. Gentlemen, let's just uh, go for another ad break quickly. Um, after this ad break, we'll continue with our discussion. We're still taking your calls. The number is 011-714-5497 and 5498. We'll be back. Stay with us. As stories are broken around the world, SABC makes sure you do not miss out. As the stories unfold throughout the day, News at 8 updates all newsworthy stories worldwide. Globally, we are there. Locally, we leave no story untold. Make a date with News at 8 every Saturday and Sunday on SABC News, Africa's news leader. Well, there's still rights and recourse. We'll still continue with our discussion on the issues that are facing road accident funded as far as uh, the relationship between the law society and the claimant are concerned. Now, before the break, you're still elaborating on these issues. And I know that I said, I mean, road accident fund on its own has not been an honest entity on its, you know, you are are declared bankrupt uh, you've got this claiming uh, or rather claiming terms where if one was found to be in um, an, a road uh, unworthy uh, vehicle they are deemed as negligent then you give them the responsibility that perhaps they should have known better uh, and I said these are loopholes perhaps for the road extent fund not to pay what do you think mr. Bobunda um, I'm not following your question Aren't you, don't you think that if the road extent fund says that if one was in a public transport then they will not be given what's due to them because the driver perhaps was not in a good position to be on the road. Don't you think that they are using that as perhaps a target not to give the funds to those who actually deserve them as a road accident fund? Well, uh, if, if you followed him on that particular aspect, he gave you um, what the legal position was prior to, prior to 2008. Absolutely. and uh, how it obtained and uh, what is being proposed uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. All what is saying is that uh, going forward, whether there's a drunkard, whether there's someone who had a license or was unlicensed, whether anyone was wrong or mm. anyone was not wrong, both the wrongdoer 
as well as the victim will be entitled in the new scheme mm. to claim I do understand on, that on, on, on the benefit. You, you, you sometimes, you, uh, some, I mean, I mean I've, I've read some of the documentation where you're saying that this looks like uh, it, it's a rewarding process to those who are doing wrong as well. It yes. doesn't only look at the interest of those who actually deserve the funds. Why do you say so? Well, uh, it, it, it should be logical mm -hmm. that and then uh, if someone was, for instance, drunk, and goes and plows mm -hmm. into the people uh, and killing the majority of the people, why should such a person be mm -hmm. entitled after such grave wrongdoing to mm. be entitled to, to a claim as, it's, as, it's, as it is being proposed? All right. Yes. Well, let's go to Mbulelo, who's calling us from Port Elizabeth. Mbulelo, welcome to Rights and Records. Hello, sir. Yes, Mbulelo, welcome. Y yes, my, my question is, if you are a passenger in a taxi, and then the taxi happened to be involved in an accident, and then after that, it, it was found that the taxi was not supposed to be on the route it's supposed to be. Mm. And then when it, that is discovered after, they have lodged a claim. Mm. And then the claim is disputed because of that. Mm. And what must he that he must do? Because you're just a passenger and you don't know the route of the taxi, whether it is in the right um, route or not. Because you're just a passenger who happened to, to, to embark on the taxi. Okay, all right, Thank Mbulelo. Uh, Mr. Mabunda wants to answer the question. Just talk to him because he's still on the line. Quickly, Mbulelo. That's why, that's why you need a lawyer. And then the lawyer is the one who will be able to assess the merits of your case and see whether uh, you are not entitled because uh, uh, like the case which you are talking about uh, it could be that and then there was a stage at which and then you would get what was then known as a limited claim and uh, there is a stage in which and then if you prove only one percent negligence of which uh, the RAF won't assist you in, in getting that one percent Mm -hmm. On getting the one percent proof of negligence, you become fully entitled to your claim. So, the important thing mm -hmm. is that uh, it is important to have lawyers because it, it is attorneys All right. who uh, who can be able to prosecute that talk claim on your behalf. Talk, talk about Sorry. seizing the moment. Just, uh, al just allow me to yeah, respond. Yes, Chris. Um, the statement that they're off wouldn't allow you to to prove the one percent is factually incorrect. We, what assist, is we assist direct claimants on the basis of the facts we determine whether there is a claim or not. Mm -hmm. So in that instance, where there is a claim, a claim mm -hmm. would be allowed, it would be quantified and damages would be paid. You do not need a lawyer. Mbulelo? I want to quickly respond to that and then the applicable scenario which Mbulelo is putting on has to do with uh, certain stages. But it is a fact that uh, in the event there is what we call a one percent one percent cases, and then uh, it is the lawyer who will assist the client to prove that one percent. And after the client has proven that one percent, that client will be able to access mm -hmm. uh, the 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 the, the monetar the monetary benefits. Mm -hmm. Now. If ever the RAF is only enforcing the law on the face of it and the client has gone directly to the RAF, they will say that you are not entitled because mm -hmm. they cannot be lawyers mm -hmm. against themselves. Uh, Chris? We don't have to be lawyers against ourselves. What we do is we provide a social security safety net to those injured in road, crash, road crashes. So what we do is we objectively determine whether the fund is liable to pay compensation. We assist the claimant to determine what that compensation should be and then mm -hmm. we pay it. But it seems like, um, I mean, especially in Mbuledo's case, especially those who suffer in a public transport do not always get reimbursed. Uh, why is it so? Those claimants who do not get reimbursed are... Uh, they have repudiated claims most likely because of the fault system that we have to operate. Mm -hmm. um, under the current dispensation, if you are at fault for causing your, the accident, uh, you have no claim. And okay. that wouldn't change whether you're using an attorney or whether you're claiming directly from the road accident fund. And a determination of liability is made firstly before quantum is investigated to determine mm -hmm. whether there's a payment due. All right. Well, let's go and uh, hear what uh, Tananino is calling us from uh, Germiston, rather, has to say. Tananino, welcome uh, to Rights and Recourse. Good day, sir. How are you? I'm well, thank you. 
Um, well, uh, thank you. Uh, this question is specifically for Mr. Chris Belamse. Yes. You know? Yeah, I just want to finally uh, with regard to, uh, I heard that uh, the Republican Party is bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So I just want to find out, like, uh, if now you have made a claim whereby uh, it has been structured through an attorney, but then uh, you've been promised to get payment, uh, but then it, it doesn't get paid. Is there any recourse uh, that you can get? So, did you get the question, Chris? I, I think I understand the question. So, the question is, if the fund makes payment to the client, yes. but the client does not receive money from his attorney, yes. what recourse does no, that? No. No. Not? No, that's, no, no. If uh, the Rudigan Fund made an undertaking mm. to make payment, because I think the, the attorney said it's in 120 days, mm. but that 130 days passes and payment is still not being made. So, is there anything, uh, any recourse that you have against the Rudigan Fund in such instances? Mm. What happened in this case? Please. Okay, I, I need to address your first question before I get to that question. Mm -hmm. uh, firstly, the fund has not been declared insolvent. What the position has been over a number of decades already is that the income it receives does, is not matched with the payments it's required to make. So if the fund had to pay all claims today, there wouldn't be money. Mm -hmm. But in terms of cash flow over time, we pay claims every day. When there aren't enough, we, uh, when there isn't enough income received during a particular month, we do uh, wait until the funds come in in order to pay, and we have a payment strategy in terms of which we pay those claims. Mm -hmm. So to, to answer your question, we do not, it's highly unlikely that your claim would have been settled within 120 days, but once settled, it is requested, payment is requested, and in terms of this payment strategy, we then pay. You must understand that we, we pay a number of categories of claims in addition to our operational cost. Mm -hmm. um, we, we settle and, and request payment of over 3 billion rand in a month and our income is uh, just above 2. So there is a shortfall and we are falling behind. Therefore there mm -hmm. is a great importance for RABS to come into place so that we can also balance the right. richness of the benefits we provide okay. with income we receive. Clearly you want to object some of the points um, as raised. I, 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 I don't want to object. Uh, or rather just, uh, yes, I, uh, he's still on the line, by the way. I'm a lawyer for the road accident fund. Okay. Uh, for that Tana Nemo? Uh, uh, Tana Nemo is that's why uh, I'm acting in a, so you'd in, a keep it in a representative capacity. Let's keep it neutral then. Yes. Uh, what do you have to say in Tana Nemo's case? Yes, um, what, what, what he's asking, he is talking about the practice which is taking place. And this practice is, um, has to do with uh, payments over. Mm -hmm. Let's say that and then there's already a court order. Um, the, in terms of law, payment after court order must be effected within 14 days of the judgment. But um, the situation at the road accident mm -hmm. fund is that in an endeavor to juggle around with the monies and mm -hmm. all that, they enter into agreement with uh, practitioners and then where court orders are made, where they elongate the mm -hmm. dates within which the payments have to be made, right. which translates it goes into around 120 days. Okay. And what the client wanted to know was if the road accident fund said will pay right. within 120 days and mm -hmm. they don't pay, what recourse does he have? Okay, just quickly because of time, gentlemen. Uh, Chris, what, what amount of public education has gone in the process in terms of uh, making road accident victims aware that they can make their own claims directly? There's a lot of communication happening around that. We also have Rough on the Road, which is an initiative where we go into the public areas or far-flung areas where the community is not that well served. Mm -hmm. We uh, inform them of their right to claim directly. We assist them with their claims. Um, so there's a lot of communication uh, continuously happening around this aspect. All right. Is the law society, can we perhaps see a different uh, behavior from this point going forward? What Especially those lawyers who will be held to account. Members of the public should not be told that you must not go to, 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 to practitioners. Mm -hmm. They may be told of the option which is available and then they are free to mm -hmm. exercise uh, that, 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 that particular decision. But going forward, uh, the legal profession has made uh, submissions regarding the RAPS and then uh, it will explore all decisions after the legislation has been mm -hmm. passed. It will depend on in which manner will the legislation be passed. Mm -hmm. If ever there are issues which are found to be unconstitutional and then uh, the process, the due process will be followed to deal with that because uh, it must be clear that the profession in general, let alone 
the, the unscrupulous individuals mm -hmm. act in the best interest of the clients and it is the duty of the lawyers to do that to make sure that uh, the, the members of the public are equally protected and then they get what is due to them. Just quickly, uh, in response to the parliamentary question last year as to whether funds are available for the remainder of the 2014-2015 financial year uh, to honour the road extent fund claims, uh, the minister indicated that the fund does not have sufficient uh, money to pay out all the claims uh, for the last two months uh, for financial year February and March. Is it still so or perhaps has, have things changed? Do you have uh, uh, new cash injections? Unfortunately, there is still a shortfall in terms of the fuel levy that we receive as opposed to the payments we require to make. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on Rights and Recourse this afternoon. Unfortunately, because of time, this is where we wrap up our discussion. Well, for road accident fund queries, uh, you can contact their call center at 0860-235523. Let me re repeat that number. It's 0860-235523. This program is repeated at 5 on Monday morning. And to fight, you can also find us on Twitter and on YouTube. From all of us right here in studio, it's goodbye and God bless you. is Newsroom.